Hi, everyone. Um, so great to see you here today. Um, thank you all for joining us for Making It in Alberta, um, presented by Creatives Empowered, BIPOC TV and Film, and Ampia. I'm so excited to introduce our three guests today and to have a great chat about what it is like working and working and living in, in Alberta. So first I'll just like to introduce all of my guests and they'll come on screen at the time. Um, we're gonna have time for questions today. So if you have a question, please put it in the comments um, and we'll get to it um, at some point during, during the time that we're chatting with you today. Um, so first I have here with me Cheryl Fogo. Cheryl is a playwright, author, and filmmaker whose work over the last 30 years has focused on the lives of Western Canadians of African descent. Um, in 2020, her NFB feature documentary, John Ware Reclaimed, had its world premiere at the Calgary International Film Festival, where it received the Alberta Feature Audience Choice Award. Um, the film was also awarded the 2021 Grand Prize in the Roca DC section of the Vue d'Afrique Festival and is now screening on nfb.ca. So make sure you take some time today or over the weekend to watch this incredible film. Um, additionally, in 2020, um, the 30th anniversary edition of Cheryl's book, Pouring Down Rain, A Black Woman Claims Her Place in the Canadian West was released by Brush Education Press. Um, Cheryl is the 2021 recipient of the Lieutenant Governor of Alberta Outstanding Artist Award the Calgary Black Chambers Black Achievement Award in Arts, Media and Entertainment, and the 2021 Doug and Lewis Mitchell Outstanding Calgary Artist Award from Calgary Arts Development. Thank you so, so much for being here today with us, Cheryl. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Happy to be here. Yeah. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Roseanne Supernaut. Um, Roseanne is an award-winning actress from East Prairie Métis Settlement in Northern Alberta. She was discovered by a Los Angeles casting director at age 13 and has gone on to have a prolific career as a performer. Um, some of Roseanne's screen credits include the Netflix hit series Blackstone, in which her haunting performance garnered several accolades. The lead character in the, also another credit of hers, the lead character in the historical pre-contact epic, Mena, for which she received the Best Actress Award at the American Indian Film Festival, and the groundbreaking feature, which I'm sure like a lot of you know and have seen, Rhymes for Young Ghouls by Jeff Barnaby, that premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival and was named a TIFF Top 10. I'm so happy to have you here with us today, Roseanne. Thank you. Hey, hi. I'm grateful to be here. Great. And uh, rounding out our panel today is Cody Lightning. Um, Cody is an established actor, originally from Alberta, and is a member of Samson Cree First Nation in Musquaxis. Um, Am I right, Cody? Um, Oh, great. Um, like Cody grew up in Los Angeles with his mother, a celebrated actress, um, Georgina Lightning, who moved there in the 1980s to pursue a career in Hollywood. He displayed artistic talent early on, landing his first role at just five years of age. So you've, you've been in it, Cody. So um, looking forward to hearing about all of your experience. Um, from there, from there, Cody. Oh, Cody's not able to hear. No, I can't hear anything. Okay. I'll just continue on our lovely um, tech team. We'll, uh, we'll talk about this. Um, from then on, Cody went on to be one of Hollywood's top Native American child, child actors of the 90s. He has worked with some of Hollywood's top actors like Johnny Depp, Joseph Gordon Levitt, Marlon Brando, Don Cheadle, Bradley Cooper, Zoe De Chanel, Luis Guzman, and Chuck Norris. Throughout his teenage years, Cody continued to work in the film and TV industry, traveling extensively across the US and Canada. His experience have enabled him to develop a unique ability to relate to people from all backgrounds and have shaped him into a remarkably diverse talent. Um, I'm just gonna continue. Um, Cody is gonna try to rejoin the stream again. Um, so Cody has spent almost almost all of his life in the entertainment industry. Um, and now in his 30, um, he's bringing all of, his, all of his experiences to create his own work 
Um, he's just finished his, his directorial debut, Hey Victor, um, which he co-wrote and acted in. So thank you all for being here with me today. Um, Cody, are you here? I yeah, sorry. It, I, it, anytime you speak, it just it's like real rattly. So I apologize if you introduced me and I didn't even say anything. It's it's uh, it's okay. Um, but we can hear you. We can okay, hear. Okay, I can hear you. I can hear you good now. I don't know what that was about. My, my apologies. <laughs> I think like everybody's used to all of, like the technical difficulties now that uh -huh. we're that we face um, with this new with this new way of doing things. So. Um, Grant, we're all going to grant ourselves some grace with this. Um, so I just like to, I'm really, I really love the the wealth of talent that we have here, the diversity of it and all that you each bring to your different roles in, in film and TV content creation. And so I'd first like to start with just learning a little bit more about your own professional journeys. So Cheryl, you've been at it for 30 years. Um, can you take us back to how you got started in the industry um, and what are some of the things that you've experienced along the way with it? Sure. Oh, just very briefly, I um, am a descendant of African-Americans who came to this part of the world in 1910, um, escaping extreme oppression in the southern U.S., where they, uh, where they were living at the time. So having grown up in Southern Alberta with um, that, that deep and long history, I was uh, gradually made aware of how absent we were from the historical record and from the books I was reading at the library. There was nothing available to me to read that reflected myself and my own experience here in this part of the world. So when I just made the decision to become a writer, it was for that reason. It was because I wanted to fill that gap, fill those holes, sort of write us into the narrative. And I had been working as a writer for a few years when I encountered a filmmaker by the name of Selwyn Jacob, who at that time was living in Edmonton and had already started documenting uh, on film the stories of African descended people in this part of the world. And Selwyn uh, persuaded me to co-write uh, a script for a series that he was directing a film for with the National Film Board of Canada. That was in 1990. And then it was some years later when Selwyn also invited me to write and direct a National Film Board full-length documentary called The Journey of Lesra Martin. And I was very reluctant to do that because I didn't know I had the tools to do that. And Selwyn, Selwyn always said, if you can create a story on paper, you can create a story on film. And I just had to trust him. And, uh, and it was with his guidance that I learned a bit more about filmmaking and, uh, and encountered, oh, there he is, um, still, still working in Vancouver although he recently retired from his job as an NFB producer, he's now working independently. So I would say that it was mentorship and guidance that, um, that allowed me to enter the film world. And uh, it, I, I honestly feel that if it wasn't for that guidance and invitation that I received from Selwyn, I wouldn't have had the confidence to think that I could become a filmmaker. Since then, I've done a lot of different things, written for TV, and uh, and as you heard most recently, directed and wrote the the um, the film about John Ware, John Ware Reclaimed. That's my journey. Yes. Also, Cheryl, that is so great, and also like the advice that Halloween gave you. Um, I see that a lot of time if people are coming into the industry from a different life experience, career experience too, thinking about how how can they make a fit into the industry. Um, and it really does take someone else seeing, seeing the vision mm -hmm. um, and encouraging them to to take that leap. So I'm I'm so grateful that you had Selwyn. Me too. Um, we're gonna we and also like I love his work. Um, Ninth Floor is one of the best documentaries that I've watched in recent years. Um, so 
and we're going to come back to the topic of mentorship soon because really want to talk about like how do we nurture the next generation of Albertans working in the film and TV industry as well. Um, but for now, I'm going to go on to Roseanne. Um, uh, you've had a lot of experience as as an actress on the screen, um, but what we also learned is that you were actually studying theater. Um, what was that like shift for you? And also like, do you have any learnings from your time studying theater, working on stage to what you're doing on screen right now? Yes, I studied theater for several years. I attended Victoria School of Performing and Visual Arts for four years. And that was when I was a teenager mostly. Um, I consider it like many other thespians <laughs> to be an anchor of the craft of acting. And now that I've matured and sort of gone through the industry, I, I can see how, like my intention, my intention isn't for it to sound fancy or anything because I feel like the craft of theater is something that you can bring to the bush. It's something that you can work with youth with when you're going to isolated communities. That's something that I've done. So I've been able to take the things that I learned in theater school from my younger years, and I've been able to take those things and I've been able to grant access for indigenous people who are aspiring to be involved in storytelling in that capacity, whether it's film um, or in theater. And I feel very fortunate. I, I never realized how lucky I was to have that. Um, it was just a lot of fun for me in those times. Like it was just really, really a lot of fun and I was pursuing a passion. Um, so in, in one regard, it's just been an anchor for me. I feel like any time, even when I'm public speaking, when I'm doing anything, when I'm doing presentations, I feel like where I'm anchored in is the training that I had in theater. Um, so in pursuing film and TV, I, I, um, I had to change a lot of things. And I learned, uh, thankfully, while I was in school, I would, I worked really hard and did, um, like on weekends, I would be doing film and TV workshops in the summers, I'd be doing audition and uh, film and TV focus workshops. And I had a lot of training that way. And it was just a lovely school and a lovely program. And I remember they brought in like, um, Sam Shepard, that was a huge, like, that was a pinnacle moment, I think, in my training there is they brought in Sam Shepard, and we got to talk to him and work with him. And it was incredible. Um, but yeah, I, I did training and film and TV as well. So it, it, it was kind of a natural transition, because honestly, I was doing them both at the same time. Um, I had an acting agent for film and TV since I was 13. So it was like both were happening, I guess, at the same time. So that, that's great. And um, I was like, yeah, I always love when people could just, I, I love the whole like transferring learning, um, but also seeing like how theater could still be valued in that space. You know, I love when you talk about working with youth too, you know, and using that in your, in, in that. Um, I will come back to some of, some of what you mentioned here as well. Um, I just want to come to Cody now, like you, um, you have a different like beginning in, in working in film and TV, um, that you were basically like raised in the industry and having like a lot of access and how that, I just want to talk a little bit about how that shaped your perspectives of the industry or even how it even, um, how it even shaped your start and your journey in it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I did have a different approach to the industry. Uh, I was raised in it. My my mom moved my siblings and myself down to Los Angeles when we were just kids. I think I was like three or four years old when we made that move. Uh, she was attending the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in Pasadena. And so we just all kind of naturally got, uh, she put us in the industry and we started very young. And uh, so I got to see it from a different, you know, 
perspective, uh, I know quite a few people um, that moved to Los Angeles or New York. They have these big dreams or, or Vancouver or uh, like Toronto or something of making it in film and TV. It's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> um, but I kind of got my foot in the door at a young age. So um, there's a lot of times people say, oh, what can I do to get my, my kids into TV or all this stuff? And really, it's like I, I, I'm not the best person to ask for that because of my approach, right? Um, my, my main thing is just, you know, take acting classes, try to get an agent and, you know, start there. Um, even with that, like I, I used to audition tons when I was a kid for different parts. Um, and with first, uh, you know, indigenous film and cinema, the parts were very limited. The, there was like maybe one or two projects per year and everyone was out for the same roles. Uh, and then also I have this big beard. <laughs> so I wasn't getting a lot of like the traditional uh, roles that other, other First Nations people were getting. Um, and then also I, I found that I was getting, doing a lot of my own work and searching for that by meeting other filmmakers and going to festivals and becoming, you know, befriending writers, directors, producers, and that was kind of my approach. Um, I, I, I don't really audition too much anymore, a lot of my stuff. And this isn't like a, oh, because <laughs> I am not big time at all. But like, I have a lot of friends or people that I know in the industry like offer me stuff, you know, and it's more meaningful to me sometimes in that way because you have more of a connection to the project, not just like getting random jobs kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, you know, that was, that's that's been my approach. And so, I'm very fortunate and grateful that my mom, uh, you know, moved us down there because we we got our foot in the door early, like I was saying. So, yeah, that's kind of how it all started. And now, you know, I'm in my 30s and making my own projects and I'm in charge of stuff. It's kind of wild. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, like when it when it all shifts now that you're in the driver's seat, you know, and seeing it from that vantage point, yeah. you know, um, You know what I mean? And I, and I often speak with people who are like actors or directors who like, once you make that shift, how does that inform um, your work then? You know, like now being uh, now being on the directing side, being the writer, you know, how does that inform your work as an actor then? Well, so with this project, Hey Victor, that I just finished, um, <laughs> <laughs> I wore quite a few hats. Um, And it was very overwhelming at times. I don't, I don't recommend people write, direct, act. It's, it was, it was, you know, even though we had a blast, we had tons of fun. It was still very overwhelming at times. And by the end of the days, some, <laughs> my brain was just scrambled eggs sometimes. I'm like, because I was in so, like every shot. So um, also I have a, a, a co co-director. I cannot take all the credit for directing, writing. Uh, my partner, Sam Miller, um, he he was my co-captain with me. So, you know, if you're directing and acting, you it, it, there's just not enough time in the day to, like, do a shot, watch playback, do a shot. That would just take too long. Um, but, you know, having trust uh, in your team, that was a, a huge thing because, um, you know, making my own projects now brought on a different form of, I don't know, kind of like anxiety. I was, I was very nervous. Um, but you know, I've, I've been in the industry for so long, so I kind of, I, I understood it in, in a different way, but still there's those kind of, you know, those jitters, those pre-production jitters. And also um, making a film during a pandemic. That was, oh my gosh, that, that brought on a whole new level of kind of like worry. Like I was like, what if someone gets COVID or what if we had shut down or this or that? And it was just, it brought on another level of, you know, uh, like I said, worry or a little bit of anxiety. But once, once we got the whole team there and everyone just, you know, uh, was doing their job and to, to the best of their abilities, it, it relieved so much stress. I was like, Oh, thank God. because I was, I was nervous. I was like, what if something messes up? What if, blah, 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 what if we have to fire someone with this? What if that? And of course my mom calmed me down. She's like, calm down. <laughs> You're going to be fine. You got a solid team. And yeah, everything's gonna work out, and it did, man. I I can't. I'm so happy with with everyone's uh, uh, you know, 
what, what everyone contributed and, and how great of a job everybody did. Yeah. And that's like, I want to talk a little bit more uh, later on about Hey Victor and some of the things that you've done on set and with this particular project as well. Um, but before I do that, I have a, a general question just for all of you so we can have a little discussion now about um, recently I've Recently, I remember somebody asked me a question about like, okay, if someone wants to make it in, in Canada, they either have to live in Toronto or Vancouver, or if they're French, live in Montreal. Um, and I counted that as just like, I don't really, I don't really believe that you have to, um, that you could really like make it from different places, but also like, you also define what making it making it means. Um, so just wanted to talk to you about that too, you know, like what is, um, like, is it possible for someone to make it in Alberta? Like what are, what's available to, and how have you, how have you done it? Like making art from that province? Um, Cheryl? That's a great question. Um, but first of all, I want to say, Cody, I'm glad you brought up your beard because I can't take my eyes off of it. It's <laughs> incredible. It's magnificent. Isn't it? <laughs> I'm, I'm always told him it's magnificent. <laughs> it really is. It's the star of this show for sure. <laughs> it makes me culturally ambiguous. True. <laughs> true. <laughs> um, I think... Uh, both of the other panelists um, alluded to how important two different things are. One is a team. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. One, one is assembling a team or finding your people, I guess, is, is a way of putting it. Um, if you live in a particular place and your stories are rooted in that place as mine are, I think you can find a way to tell those stories in that place and from that place if you have, um, if you have found your people, other people who believe in you, who believe in the story you're telling and who, who sort of uplift you and surround you with competence and skill. Um, but also there is the um, the element of transferable skills that I think comes into it as well. So when you ask, you know, how did I make it in Alberta or why have I never left Alberta to do this work? In part, it's because I did have a menu of skills that um, are, are transferable. And, and so Roseanne talked a little bit about uh, having those skills in theater that that supported her in her film work. Um, you have to be adaptable, I think. There are places in this country or across you know, Turtle Island in general where it's easier to make your work perhaps because there's an infrastructure there. But I think if you have a menu of skills and you're adaptable, you can find a way to do the work that you want to do where from the place where you want to do it um and thank you thank you that's what stood out for me even um when cody was speaking about how he created his network his community as well so that's very that's something that's huge you know if you're going to be creating in this space you have to have that and i also think, like even if you come to toronto for that that's that's part of the work as well you know um, it's not magically coming here and then things are going to fall into your lab. You still do the work of building your network and finding your community. Um, and that's part of that's part of the work. Um, so I just want to bring that question to Cody and Roseanne, if you had anything to add to that in terms of making it from. Um, from I, I would just love to share that this is where I started. Alberta mm -hmm. is where I was discovered. Um, well, discovered is such a funny word for natives, but found, <laughs> I don't know, intersected, met. I mean, th the odds of it were interesting because Renee Haynes is a fantastic casting director. If there are any Indigenous people watching this who want to be involved in film and TV, 
the number one person whose radar that you need to be on is Renee Haynes. She is one of the, if not the foremost casting director that any major film and TV production on the planet will go to and will ask for advice on how do we cast this? Who do we look for? She has spent decades um, curating, essentially curating indigenous talent and presenting it to the who's who of Hollywood. And she knows where to look. And when I when I had the very fortunate opportunity to audition for her when I was a child, um, they said the reason that they came to Alberta, and this is people from Hollywood. Like you gotta understand just the numbers of it and the odds is crazy. And they, she said, and they, they, they cast out of Alberta to this day. She said, we have very good luck in Alberta finding indigenous talent. She said, I don't know what it is, but I keep coming back and I keep succeeding because of it as a casting director. And one of the main things I teach my students in my classes is that when you're an actor, an audition, it's not always about, okay, I have the audition and I need to book a movie out of it. It's, it's, I teach my students that you need to think about it like a meeting because there's a casting director who is a middle person between you and a, an employer who is seeing you. So those are the kind of people who you want to be on the radar of. It's the casting directors because they're the people who are relaying and who are going back to major studios, like major studios in Hollywood who are making films, who are making shows, who want to know where the talent pools are. Um, so in that regard, I mean, it was lucky that AM Cree, and this is my traditional territory, um, but B, that they knew to come to a place like this. Um, but that aside, because we can't all be indigenous and be living in Alberta and kind of luck out, um, in this day and age, in my opinion, um, incredible and miraculous projects happen because of people, not because of places. Like if you look at Stephen Wolf Theater, um, what is his name? Uh, see, I'll, I'll remember his name later, sorry, I'll Google it after, but he's this prominent actor who is in Law and Order. I don't know if you guys know his name, I, it's not coming to me right now, but he runs like one of the most famous theaters in North America out of somewhere in the Midwest. I'll have to Google it. Sorry, I wish I knew off the top of my head, but it's not, okay. it, yeah, it's not because he's in New York and Stephen mm -hmm. Wolf Theater isn't in New York. It's not in Los Angeles. So there's something to be said about doing what you can, where mm -hmm. you are with what you have. And in my opinion, at the end of the day, it's really about the people who you are plugging into and synergizing with that, in my opinion, has so much more to do with succeeding than necessarily just being in a place. And the reason that people go to a place mm -hmm. is they think it has to do with the city. Mm -hmm. They think it has to do with something to do with the city. And what they're not realizing is that it has to do with people. Yeah. And we're living in the day of the World Wide Web. Everyone's online. So yeah. just like connect online and access people. That's how I feel about it anyway. Yeah. Great. Um, I, I love that. And it reminded me of like someone who I quote often, um, the director Kelly Fife Marshall, um, with her line about making making ripples where you are. And you you echoed that, Roseanne, in terms of saying like wherever you are with the people who are available there, you can still make your art. Mm. You, know, you can still make an impact um and create something that's so so amazing. Um, did you mean Gary Sinise? Gary Sinise, yes. Oh, Perfect. Steppenwolf, Steppenwolf Theater, Gary Sinise. And they're in um, Chicago, mm -hmm. which is still a, a major city. It's still a major city. But people tend to think LA, New York, Vancouver, mm -hmm. Toronto, and that's it. And it's like there's stuff happening in places outside of those cities. <laughs> yeah, there is. And I think what's also facilitating it now is, our, is how we've amped up digital communication, too digital communication and thinking even about the opportunities around like virtual production and so on. It's really opened it up where you, you could do amazing things from anywhere. 
you know we see we see even what's taking place with some of those some youth in west africa as well creating their own um, action action films as well and getting the attention of um of people in the states because they're sharing it online you know so i really think that it is it is possible to do that work um and so Cody, Cody, I know you also do LA and Alberta, you know, like what has that, what has that been like, you know, working in those two different spaces? Well, I always said, if you can make it in Alberta, you can make it anywhere. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so I actually left Los Angeles when I was 15, I moved to Idaho and I pretty much just kind of tumbleweeded all throughout the States and Canada uh, on different projects. Um, Roseanne touched on it with uh, technology. You can submit auditions or self tapes from anywhere now. Um, you used to have to be go to a casting agency and put yourself on tape and do all that stuff. But now you can you can you can send anything uh, in, in a file and people can recognize you. Um, I cast, I'd say ninety percent of my film uh through through uh the internet i because we you weren't we weren't able to audition anyone in person uh so that was that's a new challenge but um the thing with that is it's kind of tough because uh chemistry um being in front of somebody and playing with someone uh is completely different than uh chatting online and auditioning online. So I was a little bit nervous uh, with the few people that I had cast just because um, the internet and I wanted to see these people in person. Um, but yeah, so we did lots of chemistry reads through through the computer and it was a, whole, a new experience. This, this project I just worked on had so many new things to it that I'm not used to. Um, so yeah, but luckily, you know, with with the internet, you can you can submit yourself anywhere. I've been I've been doing that for years. Yeah. So um, thank you to whoever created the internet. We're able to do really good things with it now yeah. <laughs> to counter all of the evil that's done on it. You know, like amazing things happen happen within the space and through this medium. Um, and I love that we're in this conversation about community and connecting because it's at the heart of what BIPOC TV and film does. It's also what really inspired creatives, empowered for that to for for that to be built. And we have the incredible Shivani behind that as well in terms of creating communities within our different spaces, within our geographic locations. Um, and I know like for you, Cheryl, um, mentorship is something that is so near and dear to you. And mentorship is grounded in community and in connecting others and in building others up. Um, and I love, and even like your story, you know, that it's someone who saw you, you know, and gave you that push early on in your career. And that's what it is. Um, I just want to talk, have a conversation now about the value of mentorship and giving back. Like you all do it in your different ways. Um, and also just highlighting um, mentorship by us for us as well. You know, the importance of us being mentored by people who look like us, who have a cultural connection to um, ethnic connection. So I just want to talk about the importance of that and to lead it off with you, Cheryl. Um, why is mentorship so integral? to who you are and what you're doing? Partly because I think the work we do changes lives and I've even heard people say saves their lives when they feel so disconnected from the history or the story that's being told about the place which is where they are from and where they are living, when people feel disconnected from that, it has devastating long-term consequences. So I think, first of all, through the work we do of just representing or putting our stories out there for other people to find, the people who need those stories, that is an act of mentorship on its own. But then when you are... Working, for example, um, in a place like Alberta, and as Cody said, you know, it can be, um, there can be challenges to working here. 
in the creative industries, you are making ripples. You are able to pull people in and, and bring people in. So one example I took from the way that Selwyn mentored me is that he saw me at an Ampia event, you know, 32, 33 years ago, where I was one of only three people of color in the room. It was him, me, and Gil Cardinal. And he didn't know me or why I was there. He just knew, okay, this is an industry event. This person is here for some reason. So he introduced himself and learned a little bit more about me. I wasn't there because I was in a film or had made a film. I was there because my husband was connected to a film. And I learned from that that it is really important to acknowledge the presence of someone who may need um, a particular, a really specific invitation to say there there is this industry and you know uh, it's great to see you here and what brought you here and and that was how my my relationship with Selwyn built and I have I have followed that example for the last 30 years when I'm at an event a creative event where I see someone a young person of color uh, a, a young person of African descent or an indigenous person, I make a point of smiling, saying hello, introducing myself, because you never know what brought that person there or what, what they might need in terms of opening a door. Uh, I always talk about mentorship as something that allows me to both pay it backward, pay it backwards to my ancestors even to my, my cultural industry ancestors like Selwyn and to my, my um, cultural and ancestors that I'm not related to, people like John Ware, but people whose stories inspired me and, and gave me the confidence or the belief that our stories matter. But I, I pay it backwards and I pay it forwards with mentorship. I, I am able to bring those lessons that I learned, those wonderful, beautiful connections that were made for me in the past forward into the lives of younger people. So uh, yeah, it's something that I think is important to, to go back to my first point. People who are living here need to see themselves in our stories. They need to have the acknowledgement of their struggles as well as their joys. They need their full humanity acknowledged in order to thrive. So that's what it, that's what inspires me to be a mentor. Oh, that was that was that was so beautiful. <laughs> um, that was so beautiful and and perfect in terms of that. I love that in terms of paying it backwards and forwards as well. You know, because of the people who carried you um, and who cheered you on, and then making sure to doing the work for the next generation of artists coming up in our industry. Um, and you touched on something that brings me to like one of the questions that I had for Cody um, in terms of the richness of our stories. We have so many different stories to tell. And sometimes I feel like we get bogged down with single stories, you know, stories of our trauma, stories of our hurt, the painful parts of, of our existence, past and present. But I, I love that we also see stories of our joy and starting to see much more of that and our humor. And um, I love that there was a quote from the pre-interview with Cody um, where you said, um, our content as, ind as Indigenous people has been very serious for the last 10 years or so. Um, and that's not who we are as a whole. We're some of the funniest people on the planet. Um, <laughs> and I believe that because um, even recently, um, Devery Jacobs had a piece in Refinery29 talking about the humor, you know, and how like how Indigenous people also use their humor too. And that's also part of the healing, but to tell like the fullness of who you are um, instead of just like the single story of... Um, of the colonization through conquest and um, the multiple traumas that we've all faced, you know, as people who are black, indigenous, or persons of color. So I just want to talk about that. And also that, that brings us to talk about like your amazing new film, um, 
Hey Victor, which is now in post production, um, and just hearing all the great things about like you even wanting that experience to be empowering for everyone who was involved in it. So I um, just want to talk about um, Hey Victor right now. Oh, and Roseanne was in the film. So. Yep, I was just gonna say that Ro Ro Roseanne actually had a, a very funny part in my film, and she did awesome. I'm, I'm excited to uh, start editing <laughs> that stuff. Um, yeah, so. I've said this before too, in like workshops that I've done, like we're like, like you, you just, you just said it as well. Um, we are some of the funniest people on the planet and we find like, we use humor to heal from our traumas. And if, if me personally, if I didn't have my sense of humor and all of that, I don't know what, I don't, I don't even know if I would be here. Um, I'm, <laughs> The king of too soon jokes, which is sometimes gets me in trouble with friends and family. Um, there could be like an event that happens and I'm it, that's just how my brain works. Instantly, I go for like humor. Uh, hey, Victor is, you know, when we when we pitched this film, uh, my producers and myself, uh, it was a breath of fresh air for a lot of people that we were pitching it to in the sense they were like, no one's making comedies. No one's making indigenous comedies. It's all serious content. And I was like, we need to laugh. And so, but also with, with the humor, my humor might not be for everyone, just like music. Some people are into certain music and not others. Um, so I know that there's going to be some people that watch my film that might be like, eh, I went a little too far there. And then some people are like, holy crap, that is amazing. I love that. And one thing, uh, I've been doing youth work for the last five years. Uh, something that I, I tell the kids all the time is make your art, no matter what it is. Um, you, it's, it's, it's intimidating uh, a lot of times when you, when you have an idea or a vision and you're not able to express that. And that's what's keeping us down. We need to be okay expressing ourselves through our art, music, uh, anything like that, dance, all of that. Um, I've seen several filmmakers get turned down when they're trying to make uh, raise money for their projects because it doesn't fit into what's what's trending at that time or what's popular, and that's it's it's unfortunate because we don't get to tell our stories. So that's one thing with Hey Victor is it was you know it started as a joke amongst friends and I'm you know a couple of buddies and myself were like let's make this let's do it and so we went around and pitched it and people uh, all the different people that we were potentially getting funding from they were like this is awesome. Like no one ever pitches comedies. And so, yeah, it was, it just kind of happened like that, man. And just like, and like I said before the team, having a team all on board, man. Oh, we laughed so much <laughs> during this film. Yeah. And we had call it mockery there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, well, we really can't we can't wait to can't wait to see this um, and just have that experience as the audience with this film. Um, you sound so excited about it. This sounds like hard work. This really sounds like hard work mm -hmm. um, that you put into this. Even like, and I also think now, like I'm talking with like other um, Black Indigenous and people of color creatives, and a lot of them are talking about the kind of culture that they now create on set on their mm -hmm. productions. And the intentionality behind it, you know, doing doing additional check-ins with everybody, especially with everything that's happening. Like, we can't just ignore the outside world. Like, things aren't happening around us and to us as well. Um, so I love that there is that there is a generation of filmmakers who are now making that part of their work culture. Mm -hmm. so, um, so just really um cheering on cheering on people like you and to continue doing that that amazing work um i just want to um i want to let the people know if you have any questions that you want to share um any questions that you want to ask the panelists please put them in the please put them in the comments and we'll take them as they come in um, we have about like maybe 15 minutes um, left on this. So I just want to make sure that you're heard. Um, you're heard too. Um, I just want to hear too, like for you, like do you have any advice for people who are maybe like your colleagues who are trying to make work in Alberta or even for um, 
especially like emerging and aspiring filmmakers as well, like what advice would you share? Would you share outside of all the amazing things that you said today? Um, so like just start with Roseanne. Oh, this one's for me. Gotcha. I'm starting with you because I didn't get you for the last question. So I'm I like. took a nap for a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Media. Go ahead. I think that one of the main things I've learned um, throughout this is this is the truth of it all is that it's not it's not all rainbows and sunshine. It is not. Um, it takes years of paying your dues. It takes years of making sacrifices here and there. But um, even though things, there's going to be hiccups along the way is what I'm saying. But in spite of those hiccups, there is an excellent and incredible community in Alberta that is very involved and invested in film and TV. There are so many passionate individuals from Alberta who have been creating excellent content for a long time. Like don't forsake those people and don't forsake that they have the knowledge, they have the wisdom, they have the wherewithal to make it in a place in a place where you know people might stereotype or think things aren't happening but things are happening i mean cody is proof of that we're all proof of that that things happen um and i would say uh take care of yourself along the way um do what's right for you for me i had to go through a process like i had to uh, throw spaghetti at the wall, so to speak, because I was told and I do feel for me at one point, it was what I needed to do on a personal level to go to Vancouver to go to Toronto. Um, but I landed back here and I'm very happy about that. And I'm truly genuinely happy here. That's the thing about me living in Alberta, is that I'm really, really happy here. Like I'm genuinely content and happy. And when people try sauce me that like, hey, don't you think you should live in Vancouver? I'm like, yep, been there, done that, have the t-shirt. And they're like, what about Toronto? What about this? And I'm like, that's cool. Like if that's what someone else wants to do. And um, I think having a strong work ethic and knowing what you want in your life, like don't let other people tell you what to do. If you're in Alberta, if you've got things cooking, if you're making things happen, and if you're happy, then just be here and be okay with that. Um, sometimes I think we want to do what people are telling us to do, but there are like no questions asked. The game is changing. No questions asked. We have completely transitioned over to streaming. We're moving towards Amazon. We're moving towards Netflix. We're moving, all of them are moving. They kind of thought Netflix was like this like blip in the radar. They're like, ah, whatever. We've got this tentpole like circus structure for film happening and it's gonna keep going. But if you're paying attention to some of the articles coming out of Hollywood, um, that is not the case. They're, it's changing really fast. The kind of like the boys club, like the old school, like old Hollywood thing, it's kind of dying out. And that doesn't mean I'm not a fan of old Hollywood because I am. It doesn't mean I'm not a fan and lover of classics, I am. But things have changed. You know, Netflix just set up studios uh, somewhere in Canada. I think they set up two. And, and they set up an office in Toronto. Yeah, in Toronto. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't like if we make things happen in the prairies, like guaranteed, I bet we could get an office set up here. Um, for any Indigenous viewers, like Netflix is super hungry for Indigenous content right now. And they're changing things, they're changing the dynamics. So all I'm saying is that the direction we're heading in is that, yeah, you can be a content creator and stay where you are and be happy. And um, for me personally, it's like, it's also financial, like BC and Ontario have crazy taxes. Like I'd go get groceries for like 200 bucks and they'd be like, okay, that's $450. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like half of it is like HST, GST, PST. So honestly, not going to lie. One of the reasons I love to live in Alberta too, is it's like cheaper. <laughs> 
<laughs> just being totally honest. <laughs> Well that well that plays into it. That's certainly like a factor. And I think like so many people um with last year with people going shifting to virtual to working remotely, um, that's giving people the freedom of like, wow, so I could actually do my work, but I don't have to live in this very pricey city. Like I'm in I'm in Toronto and I complain about it all the time. I'm like, I'm never going to buy a house here. I'm just going to buy property in the Caribbean. And my goal is to live there for six months out of the year. <laughs> but like, that's all I'm going to do. Um, and just knowing like, but now it's thinking like, wow, have the freedom of movement in that, in that way. And seeing like where else we can be and where, and giving us a chance to explore this country. You know, I think that there's opportunity everywhere um that there's a chance for us to do that i just want to bring up um well we saw like two of the comments pop up so i'm really happy that people are enjoying this conversation um but we have one from yasmin yasmin maturin um who is an amazing documentary filmmaker her her first feature film called one of ours won the special jury prize for canadian feature documentary at hot docs this year um and she is um an amazing filmmaker. The film was about um, a family in Calgary. Um, and just so that she just said here that like, I left Calgary and felt like I had to make it work in Toronto, which I'm finding a way to do it. But this talk is inspiring to know that there are more filmmakers from Alberta doing amazing work and helping to build a community out there. So um, um, that's really, that's really great to hear. And I'm really energized by this. I'm like, I can't wait to finally visit that province. <laughs> Maybe next year I'll get a chance to do that. Um, but you've all like, you're all like really inspiring, um, in your, in your different ways and with the work that you're doing. Um, I think like you just wanted to bring that question yet just for us to maybe like we could wrap up with these in terms of what advice would you give to, um, other filmmakers um, who who are living in Alberta who would like to make a career there as well. And Cheryl, do you have anything to add? On that? Yeah, two two pieces of advice I would give. One is um, that the film industry is very hierarchical, and that sometimes people will say things like, "Oh, your story doesn't fit with what's trending right now," as Cody said, or "Oh, we're right now we're only partnering with X country, and they're not interested in black stories or or indigenous stories or whatever." That is utter nonsense. And I know that that filmmakers from um, communities that have been excluded in the past are still hearing those comments from people when they're trying to connect with sort of the older network of, of people who have kind of controlled film in this part of the world. That's utter nonsense. So don't ever let anyone tell you that your story doesn't count or isn't trendy. Um, just remember that it is. And then go back to the other advice we've all given, which is to find your community because it is through that connection that you will make your work. So go behind the scenes or go outside of the box where, you know, a, a lot of people don't know that there's a Calgary Black Film Festival. Check that out. Look at all the people that appeared on the panels for that festival. It was incredible. I was so inspired by the young people on the panels. Um, you know, go check out organizations like Making Treaty 7, who are doing work that is Indigenous-led and Indigenous-based, find those communities that have found a way to make work despite the, um, the doors that have been closed to us in the past. Those are, are my two pieces of advice that I'd like to leave with. Thank you, and um, and so powerful, and it, it ties in really well with one of the questions that we had in terms of are there any film collectives based in Alberta so people could meet each other. So, thank you. Um, you actually answered that, um, Cheryl. So thank um, thank you for those resources. Um, and then for Cody, um, Cody too. Like, what's you what's your advice? Well, there's nothing that I can honestly say that hasn't been said before. Uh, and, and with that, I mean, you know, you, you have to be resilient. You have to always give thanks and give credit where credit's due. Um, and you have to just keep keep moving forward. It's, it's a tough industry, no matter where you're from sometimes. And you could feel, uh, oh, this isn't going to get made or maybe feel a little bit defeated. And, you know, when, when, when you're able to, 
to uh, branch out and make your connections with people and share your ideas. That's number one. Having having a support system of other like-minded people. So, you know, having people that share your same vision and, and yeah, always, always giving thanks. And yeah, like I said, just, just to keep moving forward. It's, it's, it's tough sometimes. And if you're, if you're trying to get a project off the ground and no one wants to fund it or people aren't that interested, you know, you could, you can get that down feeling. And there, there's, there's times in my life where I didn't work for like a year or two, didn't get anything. Mm-hmm. And you just got to keep moving forward. We're, we're resi- uh, resilient people and we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. Um, that's so great to hear from all of you. Um, just going to scan through to see. Um, I'm, I feel so blessed and honored to meet all of you today and to have to host this conversation. And this is the reason why we um we started we started this series. Like we've done Manitoba, we did Vancouver, um, just to show people like the breadth of talent within this country and to show that it's not just concentrated in one space and also to bring um bring attention to all of the all of the amazing all the amazing people all the amazing indigenous and racialized um, and people of color people of African descent that we have across this across this great land um, and I think that yes for us to just continue doing that work and to shine a light on it and I know that while we're often like while we're navigating the many challenges of working in Canadian film and TV that we could. Um, we could hold on to we can hold on to these moments and to knowing that we're here, we're still creating, we're still doing the work, regardless, regardless of the obstacles or anything like that. You know, we're still making ripples wherever we are and we're still like doing the damn thing, you know. Like I was, I was so happy and so proud to see that all the time. Um and for everybody just um I'm this is this has been been an amazing conversation, um, and just you know the making making it in is a regional panel series presented by BIPOC TV and Film, and this is the reason why to show creators from different cities and provinces in Canada, um, where we have just people sharing their journeys um, and just talking about how badass they are <laughs> and where we are in this country. Um, so um, I'm really excited about welcoming people to wherever we are wherever we land next. Uh, wherever this virtual tour takes us. Um, and just like say thank you to Cheryl, to Roseanne, for, and to Cody for holding space with us today. Um, thank you for being here. It was so. great to be here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes, thank I'm you welcome. so much for having me. This was an yeah. amazing experience. Yeah. Yep, I'm honored, <laughs> privileged. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I'd also like to say thanks to Shivani at Creatives Empowered for co-producing this with us and for bringing together these three wonderful people. I'd also like to thank Matt from Ampia for doing all of the work in the background, making, making sure the tech is running smooth um, and that we're able to stream in all of these different areas. Um, and thank you to my amazing team at BIPOC TV and Film for you know, holding down the fort um, so many times with us and getting everything done, all the amazing graphics <laughs> and the logistics around this. Um, and as always, my heart is always so full full with gratitude for doing this work. So thank you all. Uh, this is a great way to kick off the week um, and wishing everybody a wonderful, wonderful week. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Thank you. <laughs>